it sounds to be something as simple as, you know, does the remote person have a steering wheel and pedals and take over actually driving this car, even though they're not present in the vehicle versus, you know, someone just behind a computer screen who doesn't necessarily have the ability to take over the steering inputs, the brake pedal, the accelerator, um, and they're just there as someone who is helping the system make decisions when it runs up against the limit of its understanding of a situation specifically. So this is a request by the Australian government asking, I guess, a variety of vendors um, what they should do about their policies and their regulatory framework as they consider autonomous vehicles coming into play. The Department of Infrastructures, Transport, Regional Development, Communication, the Arts was the one that submitted a request and then Tesla submitted a report. So this is like an 18 page. I did not copy all of it, but just to give you a sense of the answers that Tesla gave, and then we'll go to a summary of what they actually said in the whole article. But basically, what organization do you represent? This is Tesla. How suitable are the matters we propose to include in the safety management system? Should other matters be considered? And then Tesla said, it's our opinion that listed certification requirements are sensible, but will require further consideration and potentially specification. As an example, we suggest that data recording and sharing capability are defined in more detail so that ADSE is able to determine the regulatory expectations in terms of data types or clocks, elements. So they're saying, hey, you need to be more specific about what you're asking. Uh, needs, further consideration needs to show how the confidential and privileged nature of the data. So they right off the um, bat start asking about the data. And again, I'm, I'm not going to go through the whole report here just to show you how they've answered this. So Lord Pretty Flacco did a good job. What he did was he took that document, that PDF, and he ran it through ChatGPT and uh, he gave a, basically a summary. So this is Tesla's submission to the Australian government who's consulting on autonomous vehicle framework. And then this is Tesla's feedback on ADS. So Tesla aims to ensure that the regulatory framework in Australia is conducive to innovation, supports the safe deployment of autonomous vehicles and facilitates the commercial expansion of their autonomous driving technologies. So this is the first thing. And I think in general, it really shows that Tesla's trying to tell these regulators, you got to focus first on safety as opposed to previous criteria, um, developing common standards for safe interaction between law enforcement, emergency vehicles and autonomous driving systems, the importance of authenticating protocols, collaboration during incidents, minor software updates should not require full recertification. And that's going to be a concern because this is now software driven and every time you need to get certification. So these are the questions that they're asking. Um, and the, but at the same time, they're concerned about unauthorized modifications of ADS. Significant modifications should be strictly regulated, subjected to recertification. So they're just being very specific about that. We'll get to the two big discussion points, which is uh, first, you know, should Tesla have remote operators, remote um, control, and then should Tesla be able to have, you know, do you need to have seatbelts or lying down, those kind of things. Before we do that, what do you think about this uh, topic about a, a kind of a, a regulator, Australia in this case, asking for opinions? Well, it's definitely something that is going to have to happen. Like this conversation is just one example of a numerous or, you know, a number of conversations that are going to be had with regulators around the world who are all trying to figure out, you know, what is it that we're going to do in order to live in a world where autonomous driving solutions actually provide potentially, you know, autonomous ride hailing services. And so whether that's Tesla with their system for robo taxis, or whether that is Waymo, uh, you know, any of these other Chinese manufacturers that are trying to do something in this space, um, this is going to be something that has to be figured out. And right now, uh, you know, this is looking at national regulations for Australia, but ultimately, you know, one of the things that that struck me as is it reminded me of how the FAA was essentially, you know, convened to really put in place um, regulations that eventually basically get adopted as international standards for the aviation industry. And not everything that the FAA does really applies that way, but um, there are certain elements of what they do that are. And I think that what Tesla's beginning to do is kind of nudge people in the direction like, hey, we need to have 
some common sense general frameworks that are really compatible across different countries that allow us to really figure out how, you know, we're, we're not to the point yet where everything about how this technology is going to work is already figured out. And so we need room to explore what is the best way to implement businesses on this, both from a an ability to try different technology solutions, uh, but different ways that they are held liable or not liable for different types of, you know, like being held liable for a traffic accident is different than being held liable for the responsible handling of private customer data. And so there's, you know, a whole number of different types of responsibilities that an operator might have. And this is them really beginning to explore the full you know, in context details of of how to work that out with, uh, you know, an, a government entity. And it's cool to see the way that they're thinking about it. And hopefully we can, yeah, like I said, broaden that out to where whatever the entities that really get there first on this, we need to probably take that and just turn it into a framework that's easy to for other governments to just plug and play, essentially adopt. So this first uh, topic here is, should Tesla, is Tesla going to have remote control, remote operators? This is humans in a call center being able to control the car, operate the car, or understand what's going on in the car in case it gets caught in some sort of edge case and so forth. And to me, it's obvious that they needed to do this. And it sounds like talking to you previously, you also agree with that, but there's so many Tesla bulls who just kept saying, no, Tesla's not going to need to do this. Other car companies, I'll show you what Baidu's doing. They have it too. But if you listen to um, Elon himself, he talked about it. So let's go ahead and play that video clip of when he was asked this question at the annual shareholder meeting. Hey, Elon, on your right. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. My name's Keanu. A longtime fan of your like brand and company and everything. Um, I'm wondering, when you take the driver out of the seat for the driverless car, how do you plan to handle interventions, which I'm sure will happen at some rate, even if they're rare? Yeah, so there's, I mean, clearly we want to make sure that if, if there's no driver in the car, the probability of, of a severe intervention is extremely low. You know, you know we, um, we want to make sure like, that the car is extremely cautious around vulnerable road users, like cyclists or pedestrians. Um, so really, we'd want the um, the probability of of a, of, de of hurting a, a pedestrian or cyclist to be incredibly low, like way lower than someone driving a car. Um, now, th then there are there are inter interventions that happen where the car is simply like I don't know gets stuck down a one way street where with a like crazy construction situation um, that. But in which case it'll it'll basically phone home and say help I need I'm stuck, <laughs> and then uh, I think we we can probably solve a lot of these things just by you know remoting into the car and, and kind of like steering it like a giant RC car. Um, that's that's what I'm guessing. That, that's what we'll, what I think we'll do. Okay, so he said it right. He said we're going to just you know remote control into the car. That's what I'm guessing. Now. Um, so it's just shocking to me that some people think that that won't happen. So what's what was your interpretation of that? Well, yeah, I definitely would agree with you that this is obviously something that not only can happen, it almost essentially has to happen. Um, Cruise and Waymo, you know, both have systems in place for this exact type of thing, because once you start operating a fleet like this in the real world, then you have to deal with all of the edge cases that the real world brings. That's the the data challenge that Tesla is trying to solve. But, you know, at the first examples of, you know, really operating this fleet at scale, they're not going to have all of the edge cases solved. Ultimately, you know, I think that it's likely that we will eventually eliminate the need for these human remote operators and remote monitors um, over a long enough period of time. But at the beginning of the rollout of this technology, it's, inconceivable that we won't need to have some human judgment that is plugged in at least sometimes in some situations. And that's what this is essentially carving out uh, an ability 
to have humans in the loop as necessary. Obviously, like Elon said, they want to make sure that this is happening almost not at all. Um, the thing that we learned about Cruise was they were having, you know, more drivers necessarily than cars that were there able to take over in case of these edge case scenarios. You certainly don't want something like that. You probably want to be able to operate this where you have one remote monitor or one remote operator for a hundred cars or a thousand cars or 10,000 cars. Um, and so they're trying to do everything that they can to make sure that the FSD system that grows into this robo taxi system will be able to have very, very few errors. Um, but as anyone who you know has developed any software knows, you have to have a system in place for error handling. And that's what remote monitoring and remote operation will provide. So yeah, this photo is from Baidu. They have a self-driving uh, capability and feature and operation in China. It's called Apollo, Apollo Go, right? And they have these people that are, you know, playing it like a car. They could actually drive this car if they want to. And what we discovered with Cruise is that, you know, I don't know what their actual stat was, but every two to three miles, there had to be some sort of intervention by a human teleoperator who comes in. And so when people come into these cars and they see that there's no one there, they go, oh my God, this car is driverless. There's nobody there. They think, oh my God, look how far ahead Cruise and Waymo and Apollo is. But what they don't realize is that there's operators. We don't know how, like what the, it's it, the reason why it costs like so much money that they can't get their business model set up right is because they probably have one per one or one for every five cars. Tesla is going to do this, but if they can have very little opera, you know, just for like that edge case, he said, you know, when it gets stuck in the street, what do you do? Um, that's what this is for. So um, so this is what this is, and it's going to have to be. It's just probably going to be a lot less people. And the question is, maybe even Tesla won't be doing this. It might be outsourced to a third party. And so that's what this answer, they, their answer to the Australian government was, you know, Tesla suggests that the responsibility for safe remote operation should be defined through agreements between ADS entities and third party operators. And then they also differentiate, Tesla did, between remote monitoring and remote control recommending clear legal frameworks for each. I don't know exactly the difference are. Let's look into it a little bit more. Tesla believes that remote operators should have a valid driver's license and no recent criminal record, emphasizing the importance of training provided by ADS entities. So ADS entities like Tesla should, uh, if they have a remote operator, they should you know, clearly be able to drive. Uh, remote operation and licensing highlights their desire for a flexible yet safe regulatory framework for autonomous driving. That responsibility for remote operation should be clearly defined through contracts between companies like Tesla and also third parties. So they may use it and license it to other third parties. Who's going to do this for them? This flexibility is based on specific business models. So this example, um, that this is ChatGPT looking at that document, putting this out, saying, imagine Tesla sells autonomous trucks to a logistics company. The logistics company might not have the expertise to manage the remote operation of these trucks. So they contract contract a specialized third-party operator who provides the remote arm routing services. This third-party operator would watch over the trucks as they drive autonomously, stepping in if something unusual happens. Tesla suggests that the legal responsibility for any issues during a remote operation should be clearly outlined in the contract between Tesla and that third-party operator who's responsible. Now, Tesla differentiates between remote monitoring. They define that as where operators assist the ADS in decision-making and remote control, where operators directly manage the vehicle. They argued that these two activities require different regulatory approaches with remote control needing stricter oversight. Um, so, yeah, tell me what you think they mean by remote monitoring versus remote control. I mean, it sounds to be something as simple as, you know, does the remote person have a steering wheel and pedals and take over actually driving this car, even though they're not present in the vehicle versus the, you know, someone just behind a computer screen who doesn't necessarily have the ability to take over the steering inputs, the brake pedal, the accelerator. Um, and they're just there as someone who is helping the system make decisions when it runs up against the limit of its understanding of a situation specifically. 
Um, so that, you know, it could be something like the, the system phones back to the remote monitor, not the remote operator and says, Hey, I th am looking at the situation. I'm confused. I don't know what to do. I have the option to do nothing, uh, or which would probably be something that would end up getting, uh, basically escalated to a remote operator, or I could take path a path B or path C. Please tell me which of these four options is the best option in this scenario. And that person says, you know, I, right here, you just need to take path C. And I think that's probably the role of what a remote, um, op, not a remote operator, but a remote monitor would do um, is just help it make those decisions without ever actually, you know, pressing an accelerator pedal taking over a steering wheel, anything like that. Yeah, I agree with you. I think this shows you that Tesla is realizing that they might not need as many remote control people as other companies do. <laughs> like if he gave the example of the car goes into a one-way street and it's a dead end. Well, you got several options. You want it to do a three-way, you know, can you do a three-way, three-point turn or can you just reverse back out? So somebody says, just reverse back out. Maybe it's just going to ask the the passenger, which, what do you want me to do? What should I do next? And the operator says, so that's the remote monitor. Um, uh, yeah, rather than the remote control, right? Because Tesla's cars, you can talk to it and teach it and tell it what to do. So.